Thank you so much for walking your way all the way up the hill. I was just thinking it's a beautiful evening, so actually it wasn't such a bad thing. <clears throat> but um, normally, as you know, we are at Berg House, but they were busy tonight. So this is the next option. So, I, my name is Liz, and I work with Gaia, for those that don't know. And it's such a pleasure to welcome Mary Evelyn and John tonight, because I think we met in 1999, didn't we? In, with Thomas Berry. Yeah. And a whole lot grew from, from that for us. And Mary Evelyn and John had um, known Thomas Berry obviously for years and years before that, but for us it was the beginning of a wonderful journey, um, exploring these ideas of the universe story, of the, the fact that the true law is the law of the earth and not human-made laws and so on. But it's really wonderful to have you here because this film that we're going to see a little bit of and the books that go with it um, <clears throat> is something that has been brewing for quite a long time, hasn't it? And it's finally come, so I'm dying to see it. And I know that we're going to hear um, a lot of very exciting things. Mary Evelyn and John have done fantastic work in, in digging up the common universal understandings in different spiritualities and religions about the fact that we are part of this living, wonderful system and that we have a duty of care to <clears throat> the whole planet and the other species with whom we share the planet. And that has been fantastic work that you've been doing and, and I think that the universe is hugely grateful that you're reminding us humans who we are through our own spiritual texts. And I want to hand over to you now. Um, but before we do that, I just want to, to ask Lindsay to make a little announcement about when you can see the whole film. Sure. Hi, I'm, my name's Jane, and tomorrow night we're going to host the whole uh, film down in King's Cross at the Guardian Building in mm -hmm. King's Place at uh, 7 o'clock. And there are still places left, and we'd really love you to join us. And also on Saturday morning, for those that are interested in how this narrative supports social and environmental change, we're hosting a discussion-based workshop in the Skip Garden in King's Cross, which is just about three minutes from where the garden is. And there's some flyers outside, um, if you'd like more, ask me afterwards. So let's just, if once you've seen this, I'm sure you're going to think, where can we see the whole thing? That's so that you can relax and know that you can. Mary Evelyn and John, you're very welcome. Thank you. Good. Thank you. So, such a pleasure be with Liz and Ed again, and uh, a few of you who have helped uh, this wild tour through the UK. Um, and the, the advertisement commercial thing is not something I particularly like, but the Schumacher College asked us to also say next week, there's a, if you really get into this, there's a five-day workshop on Journey of the Universe, and Yasmin is coming um, down to it, and there are a few bursars even uh, left for that, so I'm doing my work for Schumacher College as well. Uh, but it really is a pleasure to be with people who have been thinking about these issues for such a long time and working on them in education, young people and so on, as Jane's work with Global Generation um, is, is very much involved in. And so this is impressive when people are trying to take these big ideas of a universe story and say, how can this matter to education, to our young people? And as well, the work that Liz has done with indigenous peoples, which of course is John's specialty too, and I think one of the last times we met was at the IUCN meeting in Barcelona when you were doing amazing work um, there, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, to get in this perspective of sacred land, sacred trust for the future. <laughs> So I feel this is a community of like-minded people, of like-minded souls on this journey. And um, the journey goes even further back, and John will speak about Thomas Berry, and there's a few of his books out there, but um, anything that we're involved in, it's kind of 
um, it's not exactly homage to the master or anything, but anyone who met Thomas Berry <laughs> knew and knows his presence lives on. And in fact, this year is the 100th anniversary of his birth and the 5th anniversary of his death. And there's a lot of things happening in North America <coughs> celebrating that. We're going to conference just after this in, in uh, July in California. We're doing something at Yale in November, which will be Christian responses to the journey of the universe and so on. But it's all celebrating Thomas, who actually had this idea that we need a new story. We need something to bring us together. Um, a common story, a shared story, story differentiated, obviously, by culture, by religion, by ethnicity, and, and so on. But it was a powerful idea that came out of many, many years of his thinking. And as I say, John will address that. On the Thomas Berry website, you can see this article, New Story, pretty seminal, easy to read, was done in 1978. Um, so that is some of the background of this film. As well, we've been, so Thomas Berry married us 35 years ago, um, 36 this year, I think, and uh, was a great inspiration for our work, both in world religions and ecology and this uh, journey of universe perspective. This work is, um, it is a film, but it's also a book, and it's also a series of conversations. So tonight we're gonna sort of share this whole project um, that the invitation is to the film to see this, the grandeur, the beauty, the wonder, the awe of this 14 billion year universe. And in a few moments, we'll just see the trailer, which gives you that tongue taste tip of, of what we're trying to do. And we worked with Brian Swim. Some of you know his work, and he's been at this for a very long time. And when he and Thomas met, it was like this explosion, almost a supernova, because Brian had the science background and Thomas had the history of religions and, and a tremendous sense of Asia and Europe and, and the world's religions. And so it's this fusion of, that we're describing, of science and humanities, um, which is the work that we are also doing as historians of religion, to bring together what, is the, what are the cultural stories and what is the shared story of evolution. Um, which is not an easy thing to do, and it took us 12 years to do this film. Uh, we went to Greece three times, we filmed in Samos, which is where Pythagoras was born, and Pythagoras had this notion of science and spirituality and so on. Um, but also to say there's a richness of culture, if you want the heritage of the West, uh, and, and so on. But we're also trying to say an island, this Greek island, is an image, a microcosm of the macrocosm. And we are, as a planetary system, we are an island in a much larger universe system and so on. So we worked with the first, one of the first um, directors of the Cosmos series with Carl Sagan and the team that actually came out from the UK, a, a BBC related team to do the filming and so on. So um, David Kennard is, is British, who was uh, the original director in, uh, in in Greece. So as I say, we have this connection um, to Britain, in fact, with this, uh, with this film. Um, but just for the this, this small uh, background, which we haven't actually discussed in huge detail in, uh, in some of the showings that we're doing, but every section of this film, there was a huge table that we laid out, the storyboarding with David Kennard, and each section of the film and the book has a scientific idea, a metaphor connected to it, and then what does this mean to us as humans? So it's not just a science, you know, BBC4 or Nova Channel, here's the science. It's what does this mean to say we are part of a supernova explosion where all the elements actually come to be a carbon-based life? Uh, so it changes our perspective immensely, right? So that's the invitation, that there's science here, but there's a metaphor, and that we think metaphorically, analogically, story-wise, narrative-wise, and then this deep, deeper sense of, so what does this mean? And so when we put it together with the conversations that you'll also see a little bit of tonight, the conversations are extending this sense of story and meaning from science and humanities. But I'll say a bit more about that in a few moments. 
Maybe we could just start, you, you can, sorry, you do the, before we do the trailer, Thomas Berry and New Story. All right, you keep your hook ready though. <laughs> uh, just a comment, Mary Evelyn mentions 12 years uh, in making the film, but the conversation is more like 30 years. And that conversation with Thomas Berry and Brian Swim and Mary Evelyn, myself, and many others uh, was a ongoing effort to uh, talk about a, uh, a position that Thomas Berry had articulated in which we connect with this uh, 1978 essay that he wrote called The New Story. And basically, uh, Berry was, uh, came to an understanding that, that traditional stories in the, the religions, the cosmologies, if you will, while they still continued and had, some, had much force uh, in communities, that they were not the basic understanding of the universe that was being transmitted in educational settings. That a new story in the scientific community was emerging, but it wasn't grounded in the, uh, the sense of the meaning or the hermeneutics that had been drawn up. What is the deeper implications of this story for our life behavior? So this is where Thomas Berry was trying to explore, and we use the phrase, we're in between stories, a kind of a liminal period. And this uh, sense of a, a liminal space became especially poignant when Victor Turner, the ritual specialist, began to talk himself about the nature of ritual as uh, a society uh, separating out those members who would be in the ritual and placing them in a liminal space and then return to the community with their experiences in that ritual space. And so Barry began to reflect on the new story this time as something similar to this liminal space. And indeed, the, uh, the sense of crisis that we all face in environmental issues does press us, does push us to new innovative places. It certainly pushed us to make this film. And uh, tonight then, we have several entry points into both the film and the conversation series that, that came afterwards. So let's uh, look at the trailer and uh, begin to engender a conversation, because I think that would be interesting tonight. You know, Pythagoras probably walked on this very beach. And if he were here today, he would be amazed at how much mathematical science has learned about the universe. Even a century ago, we didn't know if there were two galaxies in the entire universe. Now we know there are 100 billion, maybe even a trillion galaxies. What is the creativity that brought forth a trillion galaxies? In the last couple centuries, we have learned more about the Earth than in perhaps the previous 100,000 years. How are we going to convey that, the essence of that, to the next generation? The universe began as a great outpouring of cosmic breath, cosmic energy, that then swirled and twisted and complexified until it could burst forth into flowers and animals and fish and all of these elegant explosions of energy. These deep discoveries of science are leading to a new story of the universe. Over the course of 14 billion years, Hydrogen gas transformed itself into mountains, butterflies, the music of Bach, and you and me. For 
background uh, on the film and so on. It did come out a, a few years back, and three years in fact, and we had a conference at Yale um, on the film where we brought together scientists and humanists and scholars of, of the environment and so on. Because part of, as you can see here, part of what we're trying to do is create an even deeper dialogue between science and a sense of meaning and purpose, science and a sense of our environmental crisis, science and religious, cultural, uh, spiritual values, all of which, especially in the US, have been extremely divisive. Um, and it's one of our contentions that this sense of meaninglessness, purposelessness, um, the anxieties that were much present in the existentialist movement is still enormously present in our shared societies. And so what is, for the future generations, what is at stake here? You know, when their basic narrative of evolution within an academic framework, especially at these very powerful universities, is stripped down, randomness, purposeless, meaningless universe, have a nice day. <laughs> you know, why get up in the morning? Why connect your work and your purpose and what you want to do in life to almost anything? And this is pretty much an ideology, as, as I think you know, um, this random and purposeless universe. In fact, there's a scientist, Alan Lightman at MIT, um, who just wrote an op-ed in the New York Times on May 2nd, just a few days after the IPCC report, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, came out with the latest dire news. And this physicist, who also writes in a more popular vein in, in terms of science, he, he said um, something about loneliness in the universe. And he said, essentially, the universe could care less about us. Nature doesn't care. We have no purpose. And why even bother to take care of nature? And then the most ironic line is, all we should do is take care of ourselves. You see, that's the the end of a worldview that is very much present um, and is uh, feasting on the minds of young people who don't have a chance to see that maybe it's more complex. And on the other hand, you may have religions who just say it's all purpose, it all goes in this direction, and it's all infused you know, with the divine presence, etc. So you have this, these two very opposing views. And what we're trying to say here is Chance and necessity, purpose and emergence are much more mysteriously interwoven. It's much more complex, the chaos theory and these kinds of things that uh, science is, is showing us now. But how do you put that into a film that really invites people into that complexity, that uh, awakens the mind, the imagination, the heart, and a sense of direction. Uh, not that we are saying this is the direction, but it's simply to say, as Thomas Berry would say, we need a great story. We need an epic story, that's what moves people, for the great work of the transformation. You see, whether it's food and water issues, whether it's political issues and so on, we're in this very crucial moment in human history. And that's what is, is the background of this. Please. I'd like to just tell three short stories, if you will. Uh, one of them has to do with the showing of the film in uh, Louisville, Kentucky. And it's a gracious community up the Mississippi River. And uh, the showing was at their Museum of Science. Very lovely new uh, setting, tilted auditorium. And as we typically do, we showed the film and then had a discussion period afterwards. And the discussion was quite lively. And towards the front and off to the side was an elderly gentleman that uh, when he raised his hand, being in the front of the audience, I noticed all of the audience turned. I presume it was probably the funder who helped build the uh, building. And uh, he made this observation. Your film, he said, reminds me of when I was an undergraduate in college. And I took some humanities courses, and I remember that uh, above the door of the Delphic Oracle was the motto that uh, Socrates took as his life direction. Know thyself. And he said, that's what you're asking us to do in this film, aren't you? 
you're asking us to know ourselves in a new way. And I thought to myself, he really nailed it. He really got it that there's a call to us in our times to not simply jettison or eject, erase what we might call tradition or the past because the science community is uh, revealing or helping us enter into our own past. But he's uh, opening up that past, or the scientist rather is opening that path in a way that she might not even be totally reflective, namely our sense that uh, this is uh, the, the uh, journey that the matter has made, and that matter has come to us now. We have that conscious expression of matter that we share with animals, and indeed some would say throughout universe emergence, if it's conscious if, uh, in us, it's all the way through. Another uh, moment in the showing of the film is in China. Uh, we showed the film at the Harbin Institute of Technology, and the dean of that institution assured us that there would be 100 students who could understand the film that we didn't have the Chinese translation done. And uh, we came to the room, and there were 400 students, all talking. And when we walked in, that wonderful uh, Chinese attention, silence, they turned to us and they began to clap. You know, it's just like lifts a person up. You're really there. We made a few introductory remarks, showed the film, and then it was time for this discussion. And the dean got up and uh, let's have the first question. And he called the student. And that student looked at, I stood up and he looked at us and he said, uh, you two are married. He said, you know what love is. Tell us what love is. And how did love come out of the universe? Isn't that marvelous? I mean, this is out of a culture now which has attempted to erase its own spiritual path, past and is left with this materialist aggrandizement as, a, as an ethic. And yet, from out of that people, these voices are emerging, these youthful voices. And finally, not so much a story, but one of the major questions that we get after people have watched the film is, and in some settings, not all, but they see it and they, uh, someone raises their hand and says, uh, where's God in your film? If you're talking about creation, where's God? We had that question, we have a Spanish version and we had that in Costa Rica when we showed it. And it was a, it was, the question was framed in a lovely way by a woman up front and then spontaneously in the back, a principal of a high school stood up and she said, my goodness, she said, did you watch the film? Isn't the divine everywhere in this, uh, this created reality? So what we had tried, what we were trying to do in this film is really well, I'm a middle ground, find a middle ground, that the science community, I think, has very correctly a, reduction, a reductionist methodology. And it's such a powerful method. And I, I find, I don't have a problem with that. I, I think the analytical method is quite uh, penetrating in its ability to separate and divide. But when the reductionist method is turned into a worldview, and I think that's where Mary Ellen was taking us to, in the sense of reducing the world to a purposeless, empty, meaningless unfolding of randomness that uh, doesn't do justice. I think there's much more mystery embedded in it. And that's what we're trying, the tone that we're trying to strike in this film, is that there is at the heart of the human encounter a mystery, a wonder. And I think that wonder arches, uh, arcs to the scientists and it arcs to the religious. And it does provide a ground in which this conversation takes place. I don't think it collapses all of the voices, but it allows for plurality of interest in this question and shared dialogue. So those three. Yeah. Thank you. Um, that's a perfect um, segue to the sense that the power scientists coming on board with this and, and so on, actually we spent um, many summers during this decade of, of making it and several years finishing it and so on, but with, with a science group out in Whitby Island in uh, Washington State uh, at a little conference center working out the science and this sense of metaphor and, and so on. So it was very carefully done in conversation over many years, and Ursula Goodenough, who you'll see in a few moments, 
read the whole manuscript. She's a cell biologist. So you know, we've been in long dialogue with some very wonderful and helpful scientists. Uh, Peter Crane actually is our dean now at the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, which is a very science and policy-based school for the environment, 100 years old, which in the US is old. Um, Aldo Leopold graduated from there. But Peter Crane was the head of the Kew Botanical Gardens here in the UK, and he's British, and also at the Field Museum in Chicago, a science museum. And he has been hugely supportive of this film. We showed it at the Field Museum and, and several other natural history museums. So one of the things we want to um, underscore, if you, especially if you come tomorrow night and you have this same question, you know, where's the spiritual or whatever? We were working in an atmosphere of the US where this non-dialogue of evolution and religion is very screechy. And you have a partner here, Dawkins, who's made it quite screechy too. Um, so we don't we call it a non-dialogue, uh, in fact. But um, we do not mention overtly, you know, something spiritual or certain God. And especially because we're trying to include all the world's religions. And when we showed it in China, I could show uh, towards the end where we speak of what if we imagine the human as the mind and heart of heaven and earth. Now that is a hugely Chinese idea. Mind and heart is one character, so we're the conscious reflection, feeling, reflection of the whole universe, heaven and earth being uh, a term for the, for the whole universe and earth. So the Chinese students could immediately identify with this. And also to go on PBS in the States, the, the public television, we couldn't obviously mention anything about God. So there's all these reasons you know, for what we were trying to do there. But let's make a segue, and before we do, if there's some questions, we'll be happy to start on the questions. But what we wanted to do tonight as well was show a little bit of the, this, these conversations, um, which there are about 20 of them. And basically, I interviewed the first 10 are scientists who are deepening our understanding of the early universe and the formation of the solar system and, and so on, especially for those of us who are not scientists. But they're working out of this framework that telling the large story actually makes a difference to our understanding and our participation in it. So this represents some in the science community who it's not just knowledge for the sake of knowledge, but for a transformative presence in the world. And then it goes down to the history of, of humans and the Second 10 interviews are with what we would call the great work, the work on the ground. People doing eco-cities, like transition towns here. People doing agricultural work, permaculture work, and so on. Education, the African American community, you'll see, Native American communities, how does this matter to their communities? So again, the story, great story for the great work. Uh, so before we go to just very short clips of those, um, are there any questions or comments that come up? Did yes. you mention Say Out the Shadow? Oh, yes, thank you. Because he really started it all. Yes, thank you so much. Um, so uh, John, is, we've been running the Tayard Association also in the US for about 25 years, and Thomas Berry was the past president of that. So thank you. Um, Teilhard de Chardin, who many of you may know. How many do actually know who he was? Yeah, okay. So he was just a huge inspiration to Thomas Berry. And so that's the, the grandfather <laughs> of the movement. Thank you so much. And Teilhard, well, you should say something about it. You're president of the association. Um, <laughs> I, I have my little patter about Teilhard. Uh, uh, anthropology, cosmology, and theology. Uh, Teilhard on uh, f first, Teilhard, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, a uh, French uh, paleontologist and a Jesuit priest. And so he was interested in this whole religion and science, and even more particularly, he became enraptured with the concept of evolution. So it's really religion and evolution. And he finally came to an understanding which got him in a lot of hot water. He began to say things like uh, Genesis. Uh, no longer is my story. I, I can't position myself in that cosmology. And so he was totally committed to what he understood then as universe emergence as science was laying out that understanding. So for Teilhard, evolution had a deeply challenging and uh, 
um, an inherent mystery in the sense that he had received it from Henri Bergson. So it's Bergson's creative evolution that gave Teilhard his take on this, uh, the dynamic character of evolution as the inherent mystery. Uh, Teilhard knew of Darwin's work, but he was actually much more committed to Lamarck. So he would confuse some of the Darwinian and Lamarckian principles with regard to evolution. But uh, Teilhard's anthropology. For Teilhard, he was committed to the human in the mainstream of evolution. At the time, Teilhard's dates are 1881 to 1955, so as he came in the 1914, he was a stretcher bearer during the war. He had, he had just been ordained as a Jesuit priest. He would come out of the war and step into a position of geology as a paleontologist at the Institut du Catholique in Paris. So he, he was primed and came into his scientific, uh, a place of his scientific work. But in that first uh, uh, effort to articulate his work, he knew uh, that to situate the human as an eddy out of the mainstream was, uh, uh, for him, a mistake. And you see, the, the evolutionary uh, understanding located the human off the mainstream because we're so unusual in our consciousness and in our capacity for self-reflection. We did not extend that to animals, and certainly not to inorganic matter, so we were totally uh, unusual. And if the mainstream of evolution is this random process, religion nicely handled it at the end. We were a special creation of God. So for Teilhard, it was totally unacceptable. Into the mainstream. If there's consciousness in the human, it goes all the way back. So you can see where Teilhard is already talking about patterning in the deep universe. Consciousness in animals is different than ours, but it's there. Consciousness in inorganic matter, it's the patterning. It's not the same type of consciousness as ourselves, but it's inherent pattern. Maybe he has uh, John's Gospel, the Logos in mind. He doesn't go in that direction. Though. He really goes more towards Pythagoras as the film does. So Teilhard's anthropology, the human cannot be separated from the mainstream of evolution. His, uh, his cosmology, the universe uh, by and large, and Brian will start the film off by saying, it was typical for scientists until actually really recently, I think into the 70s, we would think of the universe as a fixed state in which things like atoms and galaxies change, but the universe itself was fixed. And it's from the 70s, uh, there were certainly inklings earlier, but from the 70s, it's, we now have a clear understanding the universe is expanding. And it's changed all of our positioning and given, of course, ammunition to the purposeless camp, which is another discussion. Let's not go in there. But uh, the sense for Teilhard of uh, a universe that was unfolding was central to his thinking. So he has this sense that the universe is not fixed. It's an unfolding universe, and hence it has a, it has a story. And for Teilhard, it came to the human. So Teilhard has this uh, strong anthropocentric character, which I would want to critique in Teilhard, but uh, he's no longer alive, so the dialogue has to be only one way. A third uh, theology, Teilhard's uh, God, it got him in all this trouble. He was exiled because of it. Uh, and just briefly, uh, there's no God out there for Teilhard. It's totally within the system. So Teilhard is struggling in his thinking, how do you talk about this divine presence in creation? And for Teilhard, he began to resolve it in his discussion of matter and spirit. He would not use the and in his writings. I'm sorry, he would at times use it, but they were matter-spirit. I, I like that phrase because they could not be separated in his understanding. They were two variables. Matter shows itself in different ways and showed a spirit but they are two sides of the same reality. So the divine is, uh, for Teilhard, a future uh, call. It is evolution, and evolution is pulling uh, matter forward. Matter tends to the curvature of space. It tends towards its own dissolution. I'll go on here. You know, the interesting thing is, 
Um, Teilhard may seem antiquated to some, but we did the 50th anniversary of his death in New York in 2005. A thousand people showed up at the UN for Teilhard. It was amazing. 200 people came from France, including Candace, former head of IMF, the head of the World Business Council on Sustainable Development, and a lot of French intellectuals and, and so on. It was quite interesting. Um, the next day at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in the Episcopal Cathedral, 1,400 people came. There were things all over New York. It was astonishing. So that background that you heard a, a glimpse of is very important for this overcoming the woundedness of our world with a sense of it's all matter, and we have a spiritual journey to heaven or something like that. You know, it's, so this is a, a fusion, a new integration. Uh, and certainly indigenous peoples understood this, but many cultures around the world have as well. Ch the Chinese culture and she is matter spirit, matter energy, you see. So anyway, um, probably with that long response to one question, <laughs> is there anything else um, emerging? Because otherwise we'll go, go to the... Uh, so what we're going to do here, and we will promise um, at the end when we have more conversation to answer uh, more briefly so that we'll have some dialogue. Yes. Um, you have the hook, you can. No, no, I'm as guilty as anyone. Uh, so just a brief introduction. This first one, what we're going to do is see three scientists, and then we're going to see three uh, engaged environmentalists. They're only three minutes each. Um, but we'll just give a brief background, and then we'll open it up for some further discussion. So the first, yes? Just a minute long. A minute long, okay, perfect, that's fine. So the first one is Joel Premack, who's a um, hugely respected scientist uh, at University of California, Santa Cruz. He works on the Hubble Telescope, he has time on that, which if you how hard that is to get and so on. But he's doing work on the early universe, and in particular, dark matter. He's one of the people who first came up with that idea and so on. So you can watch the longer versions of these. These, again, are just a little taste, okay? So this first one is Joel Premack. Joel Premack, you're one of the originators and developers of the cold dark matter theory. Can you explain it to us? Well, first of all, we now know that almost everything in the universe is invisible. All the stars in all the galaxies, the planets, the gas, the dust, everything that we can see with our telescopes adds up to about half of 1% of what's actually there. The vast majority of the matter in the universe is made of some mysterious stuff called cold dark matter. We know a lot about its properties, but we don't know what it is. Fred Koppel is a geologist at Bucknell University and has done uh, work with NASA on the Mars uh, exploration. And his specialty is uh, um, geomorphology, especially the flow of geological patterns after a, a natural disaster. So uh, Craig is uh, a longtime student of evolutionary formation. And, and especially helped us with the plate tectonics part mm -hmm. of the uh, of the film to say that these the understanding of plate tectonics, which is relatively new um, even for science, and it took about 50 years to actually prove it, and that is one of the reasons we understand this is a volcanic moving, changing universe, Earth producing sorry a life producing uh, Earth system. So mm -hmm. this is just a snippet from Craig. Well, what you've been telling us so richly is the story, isn't it? The Earth it story. It's a dynamic story. And that, to, to me, as a geologist, what makes it so fascinating, it's changing constantly. And it's changing today on a daily and a moment-by-moment -moment basis. But it's changed in the past the same, and maybe even more catastrophically in the past. What geology gives us is a sense of the timing of the story, the history of the story. We look at a mountain range like the Alps. It didn't go up overnight. It took 20 or 30 million years of uplift, little bit by little bit, fault by fault movement to get it up there. But geology gives you that breadth of time to accomplish these processes. 
So he had just flown in from New Zealand to do that. We filmed in California, and uh, he's doing all this amazing work on the glaciers and their changes and melting and so on. And the final one of a scientist, uh, I had to have a woman in there, uh, is uh, Ursula Goodenough, who, as I mentioned, helped us hugely in surveying the whole book and whatnot. But she is a cell biologist um, and has taught a course at uh, Washington University, where she's based, with colleagues from physics and chemistry. And a very, very successful course. She was head of the Cell Biology um, Society. And I realize I'm saying what they're saying because <laughs> I'm excited about what they're saying, even though I haven't looked at these ones for a while. So I'll let her say what she's going to say. And, his, and Ursula has run an institute uh, on religion in an age of science. Uh, over 50 years now, this has uh, generated a dialogue between scientists and religion. Right, and she did a book called The Sacred Depths of Nature that Oxford uh, has published. And it's a beautiful sequence of um, aspects of this evolutionary process with her reflections of awe and wonder and so on. Beautiful book. If you look in the genome of Mary Evelyn Tucker or in the genome of this plant or the genome of modern bacteria, they all have a lot of genes that they share in common, which means that we all came from an original kind of cell. It's not the first cell. The first cell was probably something much simpler. The first cell figured stuff out over maybe a billion years, but then finally something went, mm, um, you know, this works. And that basic this works, that basic plan of this common ancestor living maybe three billion years ago has never been given up. You know, everybody uses the same code because it's all set up to operate as a whole and not by chance. Yeah, I mean, that's a pretty amazing statement for a scientist, um, especially when you consider the Earth is 4.6 billion years and it took a billion years for the first cell to emerge. And she's saying we've all descended from that, another two billion years, and, uh, another billion years so, uh, for multicellular creatures to emerge. Um, and again, she's not saying this is all purposeful, but we amat we come from a common ancestor. Uh, next one. Carl uh, Anthony is uh, an influential uh, African-American leader from out of Berkeley who became, through his activism uh, in Berkeley and his education there, oriented towards social justice issues and eventually worked for the Ford Foundation. And it was during that work uh, in his life that he encountered the work of Thomas Berry. He puts it this way that uh, at a challenging moment in his life, he returned to that rational enlightenment uh, library that he had collected and selected out of his books uh, a poem by Alexander Pope. And he was contemplating it. It says, as I had done earlier in my life, to get that take again on the character of uh, the rational mind engaged with the difficulties of our times. And the more he read it, he said, uh, it was not my story. This is not my people's story. And he saw Thomas Berry's book on his shelf, and he took it out and he looked at it, and he realized, this is part of my story. So I myself, when I first met Carl Anthony, I was wondering, how, where does a, a white Anglo-Saxon from North Dakota in the United States I share a story with Carl Anthony and his family who had come out of the Carolinas. And then I heard Carl speak, and the topic, as he put it, was uh, cosmology and race. It's a really interesting uh, conjunction. And he began this talk by saying, I want you all to come with me and uh, place yourself in the highlands of North Carolina. And he said, let's look down into the Piedmont region and the coastal plain. He said, my people came in the slave ships, and this is where my family was established in slavery in North Carolina. And then he moved into deep time. He situated his people in this place, and then he moved into earth dynamics, universe dynamics. And he said, that's the story of my people also. 
And this social justice issue that I'm about is totally interwoven with the eco-justice issues of our time for biodiversity, and we are all of us caught in the issues of deep time. So Carl Anthony presents a really unique perspective on these issues. So we've been a huge shift away from the wasteful lawns to more drought resistant plants that are indigenous to the particular microclimate where they are. There's so many features of our built environment um, that are now beginning to reflect the kind of larger consciousness of making this shift of what we are becoming aware of, the relationship between the places where we live, the larger planetary reality, and the larger ecological context of the universe that we're in. If we can help our communities become more sustainable, help us to really be conscious of the miracle of life, the miracle of the universe, in everything that we do, I think we have a, a possibility also of restoring much deeper sense of meaning and connection between each other and also the life support system that makes it possible. And then we can begin to express the kind of gratitude that we need to get back. Gratitude is everything, isn't it? It is. He, he's a phenomenal person and quite a leader in this eco-justice, environmental justice movement. Um, his, he was hugely influenced by Thomas, as John just said. But you know, in a very um, personal and, and painful way, he had a brother who, uh, as a young person from inner city New York, was taken up to Maine on, um, to see the stars, you know, for the first time almost. And it was such a powerful experience. And then the civil rights movement happened and exploded. And um, in unknown circumstances and so on, I don't know if it was one of the riots or what, whatever, um, but he was killed. And he, Carl, always felt if he had this larger cosmological perspective that his life, you see, would have connected to, to something larger. So this is a hugely personal thing for Carl. Um, the next one is Native Americans. There's two of them, but we'll just show one. Uh, Mary Boy. Say, let me just say uh, about Mary. Uh, she is a student of uh, Brian Swims. Okay. But uh, the point, and Mary Evelyn, please follow up. Uh, her people are Navajo people. That's the Spanish name that are given to the Dene. De is a uh, earth. So these people in the Southwest are very close cousins uh, to the Apache. The Dene Navajo and the Apache are also Dene speakers. All of their cousins, all of their linguistic cousins are in Canada. So they came down probably the Diné, Navajo, 16, uh, 1400, and the Apache maybe 1600 on the other side, either side of the Rocky Mountain Cordillera. They share very much in common, and one idea that's central to their uh, worldview uh, is the beauty in, uh, in Navajo, Hojo. And Hojoni is to, uh, to walk in beauty. Uh, I have a brother-in-law who's uh, Diné, and he married into the uh, Crow people I study with, and so uh, Mary Ellen and I uh, share this relationship. And uh, this uh, brother-in-law, when he came up to the Crow world, uh, he began to bead. He had never beaded in his life. But the Crow people in the Northern Plains, very different language group, different cultural group, you know, it's like uh, Russia and uh, England, you know, that kind of difference. And so I would ask Willis, how could you pick this up or how could you become so proficient at it? And he said, well, you have to understand, among my people, uh, making beauty and living in beauty this way is at the heart of life. He said, it's our breath. It's that which gives us our life. So you find beauty. I think it's descriptive of all of us. And that sense of uh, de in the Dene people is that the relationship with this reality, this earth reality, is for them a way of, uh, of learning. Uh, learn from the natural world by giving. And I think we hear a little bit of this in uh, Nancy's comment. We'd love to have you describe a bit in your studies of 
the cosmology and the indigenous science of Navajo ways of knowing, of ways of being, of ways of living. The sense of interrelationship of all things is very important as a way of knowing. Um, another thing that's very important in a way is noise process. Everything's moving. It's a dynamic universe. Nothing is static. And um, these things play out through the language. But in the native languages, particularly Navajo, it's all to do with the verbs. It's a totally different way of looking at the world. When you look at everything in motion, everything's alive, everything has relationship with each other. One of the things we were trying to do with um, our African-American friends who are hugely interested in this is it's from their perspective that this unifying story can help overcome some of the differences clearly of race and, and so on. So that's, that's a huge work just in itself. And in this, you drawing on um, these two extraordinary Navajo people, the man speaks in just very slow, powerful words. It's an amazing uh, interview to hear him talk. But we're also trying to say they are suggest. Um, is this story is not overriding stories of other peoples and so on, but it's integrating with. And that's a whole other conversation. Maybe we can come to it in a, in a few moments. Um, but that's a um, that is something that needs to be hugely respected, where, where stories are coming from in various cultures and traditions. Um, our final uh, piece here is actually moving into some of the modern concerns about food and how our food is grown. And so this interview is with Penny Livingston, who's one of the leaders of the permaculture movement in Northern California, which of course is all over the U.S. and here as well. So permaculture, biodynamics, there's various uh, means of organic growing, and uh, we'll just see a few moments from Penny in Northern California. And as you've said about the soil, I love the way you put it, that the complexity of the soil is like the complexity of the earth and the whole universe. And so we're seeing it in this microcosm, if you will, and nurturing that kind of complexity. Yeah. Even though we don't understand the full dimensions of that interactive community. Yeah, once you understand how complex um, compost is, you know, and things like that, and how important these uh, building blocks of life in the form of microorganisms are to supporting all of life. It's like it's in our, it's in our body, you know, in our intestinal tract. If we didn't have the flora in our intestines, we wouldn't be able to survive. Well, the earth is the same way. Whether you're looking at the microcosms or the macrocosms, these patterns are similar. So another tool we use is understanding pattern and applying pattern, natural patterning to design. So, that's just a tongue taste tip of some marvelous people doing the great work and so on. There's eco-cities, there's eco-economics, there's education, there's a whole range of other interviews. Um, you can see the other little clips online on the Journey of the Universe uh, website.